All right, everybody. So I want to welcome Matt Arnott onto the podcast. And uh, how I know Matt is he's been my physiotherapist for the past, uh, I would say, three to five years ish, somewhere in that range. Yep. Uh, I've I've learned a ton from him. I always kind of will ask him before I go anywhere to see what he thinks about what I should do in the kind of physical training aspects or um, any kind of recovery or injury prevention or injury work. So um, Matt, do you want to give a little intro about yourself and just what you're all about? <laughs> sure thing, Corson. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where your audience is looking at this from, but uh, they know your background, that you're from Brantford, Ontario in Canada. And that's where my career has been pretty much started and it continues there. Um, I graduated from McMaster University with um, a physiotherapy degree. Prior to that, I attended the University of Ottawa for their human kinetics program. Um, I practiced in Brantford at, I think, a total of three clinics now with the past seven years have been my own that I co-own with Adam Weiss called Avenue Physiotherapy. Uh, we're primarily focused on orthopedic private practice, but caseload can consist of work-related WSID injuries for those that are familiar with that area, as well as motor vehicle accidents. Um, I've also done um, some work the past few years with uh, local prep academy in town for uh, that has a basketball and a hockey program. Um, so that's where I've kind of got my sports fix because as we've talked about, of course, and it's not, I mean, everyone's desire is to work high level sports, but the reality is uh, there's very few markets where that's all you're going to see. Most of us will see a variety of it. So I get uh, to work with a variety of uh, activity levels and clients um, and ages from uh, as young as, you know, newborns or a few weeks old up to, I don't know if I've had anyone over a hundred, they've been pretty close to that though, years of age and, and all levels of activity in between. So that's pretty much it. That, that's my professional background. I mean, Personally, I, you know, my background in sports has been, I'm, I consider myself more of a generalist than a specialist. I, I never really excelled at any one sport, but I played a lots of different sports. Um, oddly enough, hockey was not one of them, even though hockey was in my family blood. My, you know, my uncle was an OHL coach for his whole life. And so I had a steady diet of junior hockey growing up, attending games and two brothers. We played often in the backyard, but we couldn't all play, so none, none of us played. And instead, I got into, I don't know, soccer, basketball, tennis, um, distance running, CrossFit more recently. And, and yeah, that's pretty much the background that you might want to know about me. Awesome. Okay. And in terms of kind of meshing the, what you did before kind of physiotherapy, and then um, obviously what you're doing now, what was kind of the what drove you into wanting to get into that area of, of performance? Yeah, I, I remember that fairly clearly. I can still remember being in high school and not really having a great idea what I want, wanted to do. And um, at the time, I can remember I was interested in biology. I didn't really know what aspects, but of, of all the courses I was taking, that was the one that was interesting. So I'd applied for a, 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 a science you know, program honors biology in Ottawa and got accepted. And I, I believe that was just a few weeks before school had ended. I was in my last basketball game and I rolled my ankle and um, my family doctor said, well, I think you should go to physiotherapy. And I, I didn't even know what that was. And they sent me upstairs and I met um, Blair Johnson, a physiotherapist. And I can remember thinking, this is a career you work with people that are injured like this. It was really you know, really enlightening. I, I, I really thought that was the first thing that really piqued my interest, but I'd already made my decision. I went off to Ottawa and I, you know, struggled through my first year of science and everyone said, oh, don't worry. First year is always rough. And then I thought second year, I started looking around thinking, what am I doing with this? Like, honestly. And uh, I got thinking that, yeah, I was interested in that. And it started to become very apparent. Sometimes the programs you're taking at university don't lead to a career. And that got my wheels turning a little bit, I thought, first of all, I'm not going to excel at biology. Everybody in that course was headed for medicine and medicine. Although I was interested in health, I wasn't really interested in traditional medicine. So 
I remember starting to think at that point, I got to switch out to something that's going to give me a little more um, background in that area. And that's where the human kinetics came in. And, and from there, I applied to, to McMaster and thankfully got in because it's not an easy program to get into anywhere now just because of the demand for it. Um, but that's really how it, it's so it started with an injury. <laughs> and when you get in there and talk to you talk to your therapist, most of them have an injury experience because they were exposed to it one way or another. And after going through it, you realize the value in it. And uh, yeah, it's it, it, for people to have a sporting background. I get students all the time. I, I didn't mention that part, but I have mentored dozens and dozens of students over the years that are going through the McMaster program. And I've had high school students come in and job shadow and they don't know what they want to do. And they'd ask me and I tell them, it's pretty simple. You decide do you like people or not. And if you do, then maybe you should explore a field like this. If you're athletic, you start taking a kinesiology program, you learn about your body. It's very, you know, it, it's something that's easily interesting to you. It holds your attention. Therefore you do well in it. If at nothing else, you learn about how you work, which is, fascinating i think for most of us that have played sports and use your body for a living and um you know after that it, it just kind of migrated into a profession that you could help others to do that uh, yeah then i guess in to before we go into specifics of kind of what you do and what you um can offer to really help players in the the, the physiotherapy actual area um yeah what I wanted to touch on was if you had any kind of advice for people who are looking to go into that field, like you kind of briefly touched on there, but um, just any kind of advice to how to start to look into that, maybe things that um, may be helpful to consider when you're trying to decide, maybe you want to go down the physiotherapy route or you want to go somewhere else. Like what are some of the options people can be looking at there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the first thing that jumped to mind, physiotherapy is one of them. Um, a lot of people that are considering physiotherapy will also consider chiropractic or they're in the same, same line of work. Um, the other big one is athletic therapy. Um, and that's definitely something you should consider. Um, the kinesiology, graduating as a kinesiologist is also, you know, a viable option. Um, what I found when I came out though, and it depends on the market where you're working, but to be able to make a living at some of these professions is, is it, it, a lot of it comes down to who are you seeing and, and who are of those people that you're seeing, who is funding their, their source of it. So there was a lot of guys that were doing human connects and kinesiology. And they said, I'm going to come out and I'm going to be, you know, a personal trainer. I'm going to, you know, start right away. Um, that's, that's, it's not an easy job and, and right now with COVID it's even harder and there's all the switch to virtual and online and that's opening up more avenues but at the time when I was looking at it, it you couldn't really go build an insurance company for for kinesiology services and you know having a billing number was something nobody really talked about at the time but it really makes or breaks whether you can make a career out of that so I would say to, to make sure that you Think about how you want to, if, if those a profession you want, you decide which one. Um, you know, I know a lot of athletic therapists would then go on to take osteopathy and osteo osteopaths would often have, and I know it's different in the U.S., but in, in Canada, you find a lot of ATs and massage therapists that went into osteopathy because it gave them a billable source on, uh, on insurance um, claims and stuff. So that made it, that made that an, an option anyhow for, um, for billing. Um, the other thing I just, uh, sorry, you, you, what else were you asking about that or just, just in general, the idea of just advice to people who are interested. Oh, in right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say the other thing too, is, um, and, and I tell this to all the students, I said, just, well, if they've come to me, they've already had this, but you need to go experience it. You really need to get in with somebody and you don't have to do, I mean, I'll get high schools calling all the time saying, can you take a you know, a student for a co-op and, you know, as a co-op student, it's very difficult. You can't really do a whole lot unless they're going to get you to do office work, like, you know, laundry and so forth. It's not that fulfilling. What you really want to do is job shadow and, and you don't need a whole lot of time to do that. I would say bounce around and get three or four days 
with different therapists and just see what it is they do and just see if anything really interests you because the last thing you want to do is pour in all this time to get into a program do your first eight weeks and then find out you have a clinical placement and you think i don't like this at all and believe it or not i got through that that was a brutal program to get into and by christmas you know we did our first placement and after christmas there was two or three that didn't come back and i just thought well you know, how'd you get this far and not know? But if you hadn't had those experiences, uh, you wouldn't know. So try to do that. Those are the two most important things I'd say. Got it. And with physiotherapy as its own kind of field. So I've always kind of wondered this. I haven't done a lot of research into understanding, like, for example, what separates in general, like a chiropractor from a physiotherapist, um, for example. And like, what, what would you say is kind of like the main difference between the two, if there is a lot of difference? Yeah, that people have asked me that often. And, and I would say, um, I don't make the distinction between the careers as much as I make the distinction between the practitioners, because you can find two very different physiotherapists that were kind of trained under the same philosophy. And you might find a chiropractor and physiotherapist that align more um, with their line of thinking, there's a lot of latitude within the profession on how you do it. Um, you know, maybe how the program is taught is, is a little different. And at the time when I went through it, physiotherapy was sort of a hospital based profession. So it was always closely aligned with, with uh, traditional medicine in that way, whereas chiropractic had always been uh, more on, on the outside and independent. So they, um, I noticed coming out that the chiropractors were already very well versed on on the business model, whereas physiotherapists were just kind of taught, well, this is the profession, uh, go figure out the, the business part of it. And um, I'm sure it's changed now. There's, there should be a lot more focus on that in school because the reality is most of the profession is, is private practice. So um, differences or, or similarities and differences, again, I, I would just like to say that's a little more individual. The theories that are taught are different between different colleges. I mean, a chiropractor, taught in the States might be different than the Memorial College up here is, is teaching. So um, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, lump that together. But in general, I would like to think everybody's after the same thing where they identify a problem and give you solutions on how they intend to, to help you with that. Uh, got it. But yeah. sorry, having said that too, I would also say people, you know, the traditional mindset was physiotherapy. You're gonna go there and get ultrasound and machine and some exercises and you'll go home. I go see the chiropractor, he's going to crack my neck and then I'm, I'm going to go home. There is a lot of boring of those lines. Um, you know, myself, I've taken a lot of manual therapy courses. So my credentials have recognized that I have the ability to do spinal manipulation as well. And so you think, well, that's a chiropractor thing, but it's not necessarily, it's a tool that you use. And there are plenty of chiropractors that I would hope most chiropractors that also prescribe exercise and that may not have been something traditionally that you thought of when they were they were doing that they were doing more of a passive type treatment but I think more and more as as all these rehab things start to come they all start to kind of come together and they're all very similar um, treatments so. uh, yeah that makes a lot of sense like that I've always kind of seen that in a lot of different fields how it's kind of these like things will be labeled as these distinct different things. But then yeah. as you start to realize everybody's trying to move towards a more common truth of performance overall and whatever yeah. it is. And yeah, that's a, that makes sense. So I guess when you're looking for a therapist or looking for someone to work with, it would be, it, it wouldn't necessarily be like, just go to this type of person because uh, this is what their label is. It's more like actually get to know that person and see what yeah. they, they focus on. Right. Absolutely. I, I think you start to find people develop in, in any area, a little niche practice and that, that will get out there. You know, there'll be some people that I know there's one clinic in town that really likes to do a lot with, with laser for pain and soft tissue work. So if I have somebody that's really set on doing that, I send them that way. If they're, you know, um, there was a place in town that was doing a lot with concussion testing pre and post. So over there you go, if you need that, um, you try to be a generalist with everything that you can handle everything. But, um, yeah, you, if you ask around, you'll start to get, um, you know, common referral patterns from, you know, hopefully from physicians, but also from just word of mouth from other 
other teams and so forth. Right. Yeah. I think that that was one thing that I noticed with the, your approach is, and I, I don't know if I've ever gotten somebody or worked with someone that, that does this, which is you focus so much on the assessment in making sure that you have such a deep understanding of like, what it is that I'm, what's going on with me that like, that's what I would recommend with anybody in the Brentford area for sure as an athlete, like that if you want to know what it is that like is going on, you're going to spend more time focused on, okay, like what is actually happening? And then you'll try to spend less time if it's not, if you have to going after the other stuff, because you don't want to like misdiagnose and yeah, you know what? That before. <laughs> that, that's right. And I, I learned that early on. It is useless. If you don't get a good assessment on somebody, you're just making your job a lot harder. You're just spinning your wheels and, and you're wasting time. So um, my philosophy has always been, I have to be able to reproduce what it is that you're in to complain about before I can hope to help it, whether that's make it worse temporarily or make it better. If I can't impart a change to something, then yeah, you can, some of this stuff you have to work for several weeks before you see changes. So, if, you know, if you're on the wrong path, that's a lot of wasted time and, and money. And, um, you know, we like to think that in our head that you get hurt, you come in for therapy, but those kind of injuries, the traumatic ones, that's pretty obvious. Nobody really needs to do that. But most of the stuff that you see is people come in and they'll say, well, my shoulder's hurt. And then they'll say, well, how'd you do it? I don't remember. How long has it been like that? And I'll say, well, it's been like a few weeks. And then you ask them probe a little more and they say, actually it was hurting when I was, you know, in the springtime when we started doing, and then they think, yeah, actually probably it's been more like four months. And so it gets really wrapped up and it's really distant. So your job as a, as a therapist is to really tease that stuff out. You have to be able to ask the right questions to stimulate people to think back because I'm literally meeting somebody for the first time and I know nothing about them, but you have to figure out in 30, 45 minutes, where did this come from if they, if they can't help it? And that can be one of the most difficult things. So sometimes the on-field stuff, if somebody gets hurt, they, you know, you know, shoulder separation in hockey, they, oh, thank God that's easy. I can, we can just address that. But sometimes there's other stuff around there that you have to, you have to work to figure out. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the things I talk, every person that I talk to in a client or just a friend, it's, I always say the same thing. It's like, if you notice something is off, that's the best time to go. Don't wait until it's like you've ripped your shoulder off your body. And then yeah. now it's okay. Well, now I got to just start from a, like zero basically. And um, yeah, I definitely, I would say I learned that from you, especially that it's, if something feels off, it means that it's chances are it's affecting a whole bunch of other things or a yeah. bunch of other things are affecting that. Well, people will come in all the time and they'll get all upset and they'll apologize. I'm sorry. If you'd seen me last week, I could barely move. And I'll say, well, I don't want to see you when you can barely move. I can't do much with you then. So it's okay that you're not uh, at ground zero and, and that there's some movement here. We can still figure stuff out that way. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I want to make a little bit of a shift because I have a lot of things I want to ask you in terms of tools and approaches players can take. So sure. uh, yep. I, I'm going to take it as more of a rapid fire and we can let it kind of flow as we go. <laughs> go ahead. So injury prevention. So when it comes to preventing injuries, um, I know there is a lot to, to go off of there, but I guess, first of all, like what is your take on injury prevention as a more general philosophy? Like what is, what would you say that kind of in a, I don't know, a few sentences, paragraph, you're what you think, is the way to think about injury prevention. I think um, injury prevention does not happen on the ice. If we want to use hockey as a model, I think injury prevention is a, um, a philosophy and, and, and a, a very uh, total body approach. And, it's, and honestly, it's, it's more than the, the physical aspects of it too. So I, it's a pretty broad topic. I feel like you could do a whole university course on injury prevention gotcha okay cool and in terms of kind of the the most effective things that you would say um and i would say kind of let's do it more in in order of 
general importance it doesn't have to be obviously like this is the number one no yeah. matter what but what would you say kind of, kind of the top three to five things you should be looking at um as a player okay well i would say it, this this one i feel pretty strongly about that it's the same philosophy you would apply to any sport and to any training principle whether you're not competing and just and, and just living life and trying to be a better athlete it, it, it comes down to three things for me it's it's adequate sleep it's proper nutrition and then it's proper physical training whether that's biomechanics or scheduling of practices and how the, and how training is set up and and so forth but those three are pretty fundamental i think if you can follow if you can maximize all three of those things you're probably in a pretty good position to not got be hurt got it and so what I want to ask now is some more specifics about those. So when it comes to yep. sleep, are there any kind of um, like, like recommendations or thoughts you have about how to kind of be, be more effective with that or how to approach it? Yeah, I mean, this is just, it, this for me is more personally interesting because it, there isn't anybody out there that couldn't benefit from learning more about this. And I think, I mean, there's lots of people out there that you can see, but there, there's one guy that's floating around that's done a fair number of uh, podcasts and talks on with, with different people. And it, his name is Matthew Walker. Um, he's, he's a neuroscientist. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He wrote a book called Why We Sleep. Um, but he really is looking at the science behind what it is that, that sleep can do. And it's pretty powerful. But if you want to water it down, uh, shoot for seven to nine hours a night. And yet, some pretty heavy um, scientific facts of, of what happens when you get less than than seven um, a night, and it's it's not good from everything from from mood to um, to performance. The, the actual just the fundamental strength is different off, off of a bad sleep. So I don't pretend I, I did write down a few of his points because I knew we were going to talk about that, but. Um, rapidly what he had said was to you know find a routine cut out late night cardio because that affects it obviously caffeine and nicotine and alcohol consumption before bed is not something that's really helpful eat light at nighttime so your body isn't trying to digest while it should be shutting down um, lead time to unwind so it would just you know push everything and then just try to go to sleep your, your body needs to have a transition really big on the whole idea of getting into a dark room and, and body temperature has a lot to do with that. They talked about stuff like, you know, people traditionally say, hey, you know, have a hot bath before I go to bed and that makes me feel sleepy. But really what it does is it sets you up um, from a, a biochemistry standpoint, your, your body gets really warm quickly when you're in the water. And then when you come out, there's a bit of a heat dump where your extremities cool down so that your blood flow can stay you know, more central to your core and, and having coolness in the, in the extremities was really helpful for people being able to, uh, to settle down and fall asleep. So those are some of the ideas, um, sunshine in the daytime. It also helps with prepare all the stuff that we think we've mastered, you know, recently. And you think realistically we've been sleeping for hundreds of years and haven't had to be taught how to do that when there was no electricity sun went down you go to sleep so trying to think you've got a better schedule that science can come up with something better than that is kind of foolish so in the end get seven to nine hours and life will be a lot better yeah gotcha okay and when it comes to kind of nutrition or in terms yep. of the kind of more physical areas let's let's touch on those and any kind of core recommendations or things that you're playing with or experimenting with the guy I went to, he's a, he's actually a Canadian, went to Western University, John Berardi. Um, just go look at him, precision nutrition. It's it, There's lots of variations on things, but him with a 40, 40, 30 percentage split on protein, carbs, and cal and, and fats. I mean, it's, that's some pretty sound stuff in there. There's nothing, there's some of those, what's in, you know, there's so many things out there, you know, try keto, try paleo, um, and some things work for certain people, but this is more of a generalist approach that I don't think anyone's going to go wrong with teaching people how to eat based on, you know, food portion size, using your hand as something that you can do to make it convenient to work on. But um, 
I'll leave it at that, but that's just B E R A uh, R D I Berardi, John Berardi. Take a look at him. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely make sure to include him in the yep. uh, description for people. Cool. And then in terms of the physical and kind of biomechanics, warm up, training, stuff like that, like, are there any kind of things that uh, maybe players are, aren't hearing about as much that they should be focusing on? Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, it depends how far back you want to go, but I think the philosophy now is when you're looking at general, uh, you, you want to produce good athletes and good athletes come with good movement patterns. And you can tell when somebody moves well, you can tell somebody who's a good athlete, just watch the move and you think, oh, that guy's got good athletics. And what does that mean? Well, it probably means that, you know, they know how to squat properly. They know how to hinge properly. They know, um, all those landing patterns when they come down from a jump, things that look effortless or, or fluid. Um, so I think some basic training and some of that really, once you've got those basic patterns down, um, I think that's really fundamental for everything else. So it depends who we're talking to here, but I would say that um, if you're working with a trainer or, or a conditioning coach or, or somebody, um, make sure that there's somebody who knows how to assess for those things, because, you know, the mechanic, like just looking at somebody and saying, oh, your, your knees aren't shoulder width apart. That's not a good squat. Um, there's so much variation in the human body and, and looking at somebody has got to put their hands on you and figure out what does the shape of your hip joint look like um, for somebody with really wide stance. It might be because their um, hips are super deep and that's the, the, the path of least resistance when they're rolling that joint to the, to the motion. So that kind of stuff is, um, there's so many things that are just like sound bites where people hear them and they think, Oh yeah, I can just apply that, but things should be individualized. So, uh, you know, getting somebody, getting to know your body and going through some of those things is, is really important. Um, as, as far as, you know, specifics to hockey, I would say, you know, people are always interested in, you know, what makes, what makes people skate faster than other people. And, you know, we can look at characteristics and say, well, we know that fast skaters have a, tendency to get a little more hip and knee flexion when they're doing it. So they're getting a bigger stride length. They're, um, you know, leaning more forward at the torso and more ankle dorsiflexion. So when you start seeing those, it, it's similar to runners. You can see certain patterns in the more elite ones. And that doesn't mean everybody has to do it, but those are things that we would try to um, encourage and make sure if someone were coming to see me that they say, well, that's what I want to do. I want to stay faster. I said, well, okay, let's, see what kind of mobility you have in your ankles and your hips and your knee joints. Let's see um, what kind of strength you have. Hockey is all about trying to prevent your legs from collapsing in. So external rotation strength of your hips. Hips are so big, you know, about hips. <laughs> and and uh, it, so to me, it's a lot of that comes down to making sure that there is adequate strength where it needs to be for the, for the job at hand. And that's being able to skate fast or powerfully. And, and there are ways to, ensure that that's happening by testing so mm. that's one aspect i would say mm -hmm. okay and one thing that i want to touch on because I, i'd like to hear your philosophy on this or what you think and it's the idea of kind of like western versus eastern the the approach that is typically taken to be more preventative versus like managing the issue when it occurs and saying hey like once there's a problem and injury now is the time to deal with it and fix things. Do you, would you recommend or would you say to someone who's maybe a young athlete or whatever age, would you say it's a good idea to take a more kind of like Eastern approach of come in before there's a problem, like come in and work with me and get these mechan biomechanics lined up, like understand where the issues that you don't know about. Like, would you say that's a good philosophy? I, I do. I, I do actually. And, and, and recently in town, I've, I've, I've aligned myself with a uh, professional tennis in, wow. instructor and, and she's actually sent some of her athletes in just to be assessed for, just for that reason. Wow. You know, when you get kids that are in that 12, 13, 14, your body's still growing, but those are the real times where you have to know those movement patterns that we can discuss. And if they're not hammered in at that age group, um, you can develop some bad habits and then they're really hard to undo. So yeah, I'm, I'm all about that at, at this point. And there's starting to be good research on, you know, certain characteristics that you can say, I don't know if we talked about this before or not, but 
I, I like to use this example because I think it's where science meets grassroot level. And somebody was telling me that they, their daughter was playing basketball and there was somebody coming in with a clipboard saying this is a couple of years ago before COVID. And she was watching and thought, oh, this must be a, a scout coming in. And when he went to talk to them, she said, no, I'm actually, she was from an organization that was looking at pre-screening um, young girls to see who was it using research on ACL tear rates and NCAA players. And it was all based on landing strategies off of a jump. And they were able to predict just, they were watching how the girls were jumping and landing and they would then approach them to say, you know, this is something that we should talk about. And uh, um, so I think that's, you know, that is really what we should be doing with the knowledge we're getting is getting at those kids at an early age so that um, things like that don't happen because <laughs> it, a yeah. lot of that as there's injury prevention at its best right there yeah. free screening yeah and that's interesting because that really inspires me to um when i meet my new trainers and like new athletic trainers is to say hey like would you guys be interested in working with as many guys as who are interested in doing kind of like a pre-season screening so that we yeah. have like a really clear understanding because i think it's very easy like going into a season you go from you're preparing, you're getting your body ready. And then you hit a point where now like things ramp up to like 110% and you're basically mm -hmm. on the edge of breaking down for six weeks before the season starts, at least in college. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think that's definitely something that I will look into. Cause I think that's a, something a lot of players would benefit from in the future. Yeah. And, and I would also say, I mean, this is a whole other topic. I mean, this could go on all night when you mentioned the concussion word, but uh, concussion is a very big part of, of, of any sport contact, sport hockey included. And, um, and, and there are, you know, there are, there are pre-screening tools you can do um, to get baselines before a season starts. Because the hardest thing to do is when you get somebody and you test them after, you think, well, what were they like before? What, what am I trying to return them to? And if they've, had a history, it becomes even more important of what, what is the baseline we're trying to shoot everybody back to before you're ready to go back. And if you don't know where they started, it's pretty hard to know where they are or, you know, to place that. So that's another example. Yeah, no, that is very valuable. And I think it's, it's the hardest when your mind is altered to make a good decision yourself on what's wrong yeah. with your mind. <laughs> no, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little later because it, it that's a it's at a point where you really it, it's really up to the team around you because you're not able to make sound decisions yourself when the source of those decisions has been injured yeah so you've got to have a strong team to advocate for your good a good health care team got it yeah okay so let's shift a little bit into okay so we haven't been able to prevent the injury so now you're at the point where now you're managing the issue and yep what are some of the core things you look at and um, offer to players to manage injury? Um, I guess the first thing is to decide, you know, is it acute? Is it chronic? If it's an acute injury, we're all pretty good at that. Get off, ice it, price, pressure, ice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, protect the injury so it doesn't get worse. If it's chronic, um, and chronic's a little harder to, that's more on the individual to be able to identify that. So you've got to be honest with your team and tell them, you know, I'm noticing something that's been there. It's, it's lasted more than 48 hours. So I'm no longer in that, you know, acute state, but there's something that's not going away. Um, you know, I'm starting to lose function. I'm not skating as fast. My power's going, you know, if you've got a really, you know, astute, trainer there they might notice that but you're going to have to look for those sort of things yourself um, I think after you identify it you need to make sure that you're getting assessed um, that's that's on you to do that if, if someone else wants to do it for you but um, uh, once you've got assessed um, there'll be a lot of interaction where I got to ask you questions and sometimes um, I know traditionally in hockey it's been more of a you know I got to be dragged in there before I'm going to say anything but you're really not helping yourself or or your therapist to be able to make those decisions for you um you've got to listen to your your body and be honest like trying to downplay the severity of something isn't going to get you any points in the uh 
in the rehab world and it's certainly not going to get you back out healthy any faster it might get you on the ice faster but that just sets you up for further further injury so following that then you know you got to follow the guidance that you're given um right it should be a collaborative approach but somebody's going to give you guidance and uh keep in mind that their primary interest should be in you and your health and sometimes we need to protect players from themselves because that competitive nature and that self-drive will push them to do things that maybe their body really shouldn't go through and, and they're going to hurt themselves further. So, um, you know, that's big. Um, and then I think as we, we talked about more recently about that communication with the team, making sure that everybody is aware there's a lot of pressure on players, you know, whether they feel it from the coaching staff, from the owners that you've got to get back out there and you've got to perform. Um, I try to take that decision out of their hands by, you know, and, and coaches and all those staff don't necessarily understand physiology of injuries, but you can put it in a language they can understand like a green light, yellow light, red light, and just give that approach and say, yeah, red, he's not playing till we give you clearance yellow. They can go out there, but maybe in scrimmage, there's no contact for a little bit. And then we're working them back up and green lights, just go ahead. And, and, you know, I know the coaches I work with really appreciate just that, clarity where they just say okay and um you know when you're playing your role properly they they adhere to it there shouldn't be any judgment on it it's all right that's what they say you know that's what you do so go ahead and do that right and do your rehabilitation you know just work at it it's your, it's your job at this point so do that and then and protect yourself when you go back and that's basically how you manage it yeah. um we we talked before too but i think um, mental rehab as much as physical when we talk about just rehabbing it there's there's a whole lot that can go into an injury depending on what kind you've had I mean, you, you know you tear your acl and you're ready to go back out on the ice and it's totally okay you're clear go back to your first game if you haven't prepared yourself mentally as you've been going through that physical rehab you can hurt yourself just as easily even though your body's ready because you're you get tentative and hold back and it, yeah things happen <laughs> so yeah yeah, and I think uh, the one thing I want to touch on there because I myself have been in been through it, and I've really made the shift to. I I've I've watched a lot of players make a mistake. They try to push through injuries. They try to hide things from their trainer in the fear of kind of like you said there, where it's I I don't want my trainer to like stop me from playing. And yeah. uh, one of the things I think is really important, and like I think it comes with maturity, and hopefully we can provide some of that kind of insight is you're doing that because long-term performance, like if a per, if a person wants to end their season, but end their whole career after one year, then, okay. Like yeah. you, you could take a different approach, but you're looking at someone as, Hey, like I'm expecting you want to play until you're 30 or whatever time. And I want to allow you to play at your best for the longest amount of time possible. And mm -hmm. um, it's, very easy to forget that your trainer that's their job is to maximize your performance long term and yeah. yeah it scares a lot of people away so is there anything from your perspective that you would you would offer there to for players to consider that I didn't mention there yeah no listen that of course that's a really it's a really hard sell because again it's just like you said a lot of it comes down to age and maturity and your experience as much as we like to say that we follow the science and so forth every person you know has at their core their prior experience and that's really what sets the stage for them going forward in, in terms of what they're willing to do and, and willing to sacrifice and yeah you you do bounce back you can put up with a lot more when, when you're younger but you know that same body you have to carry through your entire life and i tell people this more commonly when I see them with workplace injuries, they, they get hurt on the line. And I said, you know what? They said, well, I don't want to let my employer down. You know, they'll, they'll be mad at me and they've been so good. I've worked for so many years. I just want to see if I can get through this. And, and I said, in the end, I said, when you stop, there will be another employee to replace you. There'll be another, you know, defenseman that they can find to get in to, to carry on your position. But your body is something that you're going to have for the rest of your life. And if you blow it up um, for one big push, uh, and there's no easy way to, to tell somebody that. And you just hope that they don't look back 20 years later and say, 
yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that, you know, gone out for that last, that last shift. So I think honestly, it's, it, you try to encourage that conversation, but in the end, um, you just hope that there's somebody's there that's going to protect you. And, and that, that that's what your, your medical staff is there to do for you. Yeah. They're not there just to inject you and send you back out again, because you say, I want to play in the third period. <laughs> um, and I mean, all that stuff with Kessler, you've seen all those TSN things. It's tragic when you see those guys. And I think really watching them, watching people that have gone through that it is probably the best way to, uh, to really get an appreciation for what it is that you're taking or risking when you, when you do stuff like that. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And it, I, we will touch on like making mistakes with, with training and pushing through things. But I, I noticed with my dad, he made this mistake of he pushed himself really hard on bench for a while when he was younger and he'd do bench press and he would do like really wide grip and mm -hmm. he could bench more and he's able to put up more weight. But now being like getting in his fifties and man, realizing that he no longer has a sh like a functional shoulder anymore and he still wants to train, still wants to be healthy. He looks back on that and realizes like, yeah, it was cool that I could put up an extra 50 pounds or I could push harder <laughs> But yeah. it, it's the remember that like you still you may actually hit that like lose your shoulder even earlier if you just yeah. keep pushing through because you don't know what's actually wrong with your body until you talk to someone who is an expert at understanding what happens That's when right. you make that mistake. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But I mean, it, it's in some, in some ways, it's no different than substance abuse, right? When you get into that feeling, it's, you know, the runner's high, it's, it's all this where you just get um, mentally rewired. You, you know, it's such an important thing, because there's a, a feeling of accomplishment that you get when you when you're on the ice, when you're pushing that weight. Um, and, and it's hard to let that go. Um, it, you know, I mean, I personally, I still struggle with that kind of stuff with intensity when you're pushing yourself and thinking, eh, they got a rest day schedule, but do I really need to take that rest day? And you start thinking when you skip a few of them, you start to feel a pack up and you think, yeah, maybe, maybe it's there for a reason. And so if you can't pull yourself back, you have to have people around you that will help you help you recognize that. But I, you know, stories like that are, are really important, but the number of times I see guys that say oh, I'm in the gym and I see a young guy doing that and I try to tell them and they say ah screw off this, you know you don't know what you're talking about and they say well you'll wait you'll be there in 20 years and that never goes over well that that kind of conversation but I I think um, I still think it's it's really important and I think yeah it's important for me to have that conversation with people because as you know even if your dad's telling you sometimes if hearing it from somebody close to you it doesn't register the same as it does when you hear it from from somebody else but um everybody's got their own way there's a way into it where you have a conversation that a light switch goes on for the person and they have that aha moment where they think oh okay and so you know physio is a lot of times it's trying to have that conversation with people and and get the buy-in you know when you got them and you get that by building trust and showing them that you're not there to wreck this or that you're just there for them you know yeah. Does it make my day go any better, whether you do this or not? I'm just telling you what's, what's best for you. Right. Yeah. And I think that's one of the main things I look at with my, like this podcast is creating a platform where the players who want this information, who are willing to spend an hour listening to someone who is an expert in something that maybe they're not super interested in, but they, they know there's value there. And then that's yeah. where I want to provide that opportunity for players to hopefully like they hear these conversations and that kind of clicks for them that, okay, like maybe I'm going to consider that the next time I know for me, it was like this summer, I tried to do a lot of deadlifts and mm -hmm. I realized like I progressed, I did very well, got very strong. I was all excited. I got over three plates. And then there was a point at which I did like, three or four deadlifts in like a nine day span or something. And mm -hmm. I misprogrammed, I misrealized what I had done. And once I hit that, I realized, okay, like that's exactly what happens when you forget these like really core principles that you may hear a hundred times, but maybe it's like 101 times that clicks for them. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. You're right. Um, it, 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 there's no, there's nothing wrong with going through a, 
a strength cycle like that, but you get to that end where you shoot your PR and you get it and you think, oh, maybe I can do the next one next week. You need to follow that with the deload. Your body is just not ready. You come as close to failure as you're going to get to get to that level and you better give it time to recover or you just start that cumulative breakdown of things where ah, you're pulled with something else and you spring that a little bit. And then the next time you do it, you have to pull a little harder with your legs and the hamstring. Yeah. So yeah, it's really important. Really important. Awesome. Okay. So one thing I do want to touch on, so I want to come back to the rehab mindset a little bit later, because I know we kind of discussed that in a lot of ways in the last little bit. Um, Yeah. But when it comes to exercises to do on a regular basis. So I know that like you may be a player who's listening and somebody may say, okay, like I have a trainer, they have a whole plan for me and Mm -hmm. I'm going to follow that. So there's those people and maybe there's some advice you may offer there. And then the second one I want to ask after is for people who maybe don't have a super strict program and they're following something more general what are some things that they should be looking to implement into kind of their, their program? So yeah, the first one being like players who already have a strict regimen, what would you say are some things that maybe they're, they may miss or that's really commonly missed? Okay. Um, we're, we're going to talk specifically for hockey and I, and I've come up with a few things that I think might be a little off the beaten path because we all know the value of doing squats and the deadlifts and, you know, but, even the sleds, but, um, you know, one of the things I would look at for sure is, is neck isometrics. Mm. And I don't know if that's something that's regularly trained, but there is decent evidence that you can prevent concussions if your neck's stronger. So even some simple things like, you know, doing some pushing in here, you don't have to go hard, like 30% of your maximum contraction, hold for 10 seconds, go to the other side, forward, backward, you know, just a steady diet of that into your cycle can really pay dividends for preventing injury down the road. Uh, Um, And just before you go on with that, is there any kind of um, recommended kind of approach you would take to that? So like I know for, I do like weighted wrist rollers and I like to look, think of that as I do that like once a day, I'll just grab that. I'll do some quick wrist rollers and just have that constant volume. Um, Yep. Would you recommend something like that for them? And then what's kind of a rep range and set range that um, would be the average approach that someone could take and um, adjust? Yeah, this? when you're looking at things like that, if you're doing something that's like 30% maximum voluntary contraction, you by definition there aren't really hitting, you're hitting a lot of more slow twitch um, postural muscles. So they don't fatigue as easily. They recover more quickly. They can handle more volume. So daily yeah you could probably do that thing kind of daily and i would do you know um 10 second holds and i might do you know five sets of that for each direction um would you do it more than once a day probably not there's enough training that you've got to do in your life that you don't want to start thinking like three times a day if 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 you've injured something and we're focusing on that Mm -hmm. might be a little more different i might ask you to do you know you're not playing the game right now you're out so you've got more time to spend on that and then we might increase that but for just putting it into a program, I think five by 10 seconds is, is doable and it's more than you do otherwise. And, and that will show gains over time doing that. Got it. And with that, I, again, I just like to look at, okay, like if I'm going to go do this next week or I'm going to start this tomorrow, yeah. would it be, you'd recommend just doing kind of more of a, the working on the, I don't know the muscles specifically, but yeah. the side motion and kind of resisting that or would you recommend kind of the forward or backward or all of them i would do all i do all four i would do you know right side flexion resisted left side flexion forward flexion and extension backwards you don't worry about the muscles you just globally the movements that you're going to have to resist those are the ones got it okay and around kind of five sets of 10 seconds for each of those kind of things would be a a solid recommendation Awesome. Yeah, ice usually 10, 10 seconds is usually what you're going to get before there's like progressive fatigue and that fiber for holding that contraction. So that's a, that's a decent number to shoot for people like round numbers, 10 seconds. I mean, you can get more specific, but yeah, I don't need to. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. That's even just that may be a takeaway for someone that 
may give them something huge that helps save them from a concussion in the future. So yeah, that's great. Okay. And, um, it, you know, another big one, I think, I think, especially in hockey, you spend a lot of the time, you know, on the boards and, and it, we, it's not just open chain stuff. We talk about open chain where you're holding a free weight, moving it around, but other times where your, your, your hand is fixed on something, be that on the ice, be that on the, you know, on the boards where you're trying to move off of that. So, um, I think another good exercise along, you know, core is always important, but doing in, incorporating the two of those things would be, would be good. So like plank holds or plank sidewalks, um, those are all good, uh, good ways to, to build some, some, some strength through the joints and, and, and having that press power, the ability to hold things off. Hmm. Um, along with that, have you heard of Palov press? You know that one? Palov is, is the name of it, but essentially if I had, you know, like a resistance band there and I grabbed hold of it and I pulled it some tension and I into my chest and then I just move it out back and forth, hmm. either from a kneeling position or standing position, it builds a lot of, you know, those are all safe exercises to do because it's trying to hold yourself in neutral. So something's trying to take you out of rotation. I want to train my core. If I push this load, it's going to want to pull me back in this way. And I'm resisting that from happening. So we use those a lot in rehab when you're taking somebody that's been injured, have a disc injury in their back. And they, you know, you want to avoid rotation because that's how it injured in the first place, but you need to strengthen against that. So let's just do one where you don't let yourself move out of that position. Your spine's still neutral. It doesn't get hurt doing it. And you build up that suit of armor around it. Wow. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd recommend there? or uh, For? For in general. Exercise? Oh, yeah. Sorry. You, yeah. You're talking about like the supplement to your program that you're doing. Yeah. Um, uh, you're probably going to get, I mean, if you if it's a good program, there's probably sleds and a lot of posterior chain activities with versions of, of, of deadlifts or Romanian. So that, that's fine. But, um, uh, you, you know, another one that would be kind of strange, but I exercises, um, hockey more and more is more about speed reaction time, hand eye coordination, the faster you can get input in, um, you know, the, the better athlete you are and, and, so I think not enough time is spent on something like that. Like who's going to go to the gym and work their eyeballs. But the reality is that could pay some pretty heavy dividends in seeing something coming that you can react to, maybe avoid getting hit or be able to pull the puck down um, more quickly. So we'll pull in some of those um, exercises that we do to somebody that might be sort of advanced training for a concussion where you're, you know, doing some, uh, we're targeting an object and moving their head back and forth while keeping their eyes fixed. I mean, maybe eventually trying to walk and do that at the same time challenges your vestibular system. Plus what your, your ability to, to hold focus, the ability to shift back and forth between two points between your eyeballs very quickly is, is really crucial to be able to find a target, let it go and go pick up another one. So, um, you know, I couldn't give you one exercise, but that's a whole slew of them that you could even look into. A lot of them are just, if you kind of went on, under habituation exercises, it, it's, it's more of a building tolerance with, um, um, you know, eye type movements and, and visual, visual demand. So I'd like, I, I think that would be something else that would be good. But, um, and then I guess I would probably say the one other one that I might throw in there just because I think it's a very, best bang for your buck exercise is, is the Turkish get up. <laughs> if you're familiar with that one. Um, and I'm not going to demonstrate it, but essentially, do you know what I mean? You... Yeah, basically. And I I'll, I'll give my explanation. You can correct it. Um, but what I do is I, I consider it like you put a, you lay on your back flat with your legs extended and then you put a dumbbell or kettlebell and press it directly above you. And then you basically have to get up in a sequence in order to get like to a full stand. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. You, you, it, you probably start with it at your side. So you've got to start on your side. You have to roll over. You have to load in that arm. You have to press it up. And then from there, you have to, yeah, exactly. If you said get to a sitting position, kneeling position, stand it up, and then reverse it on the way back down. And it uses just about every muscle group in your body. It, it, you have to be able to stack. And that's what's so important about it is getting getting the ability to move 
smoothly requires you to stack your joints over top of each other and get the most power out of that. Um, if you are inefficient or if you have poor mechanics and you will bleed power like crazy through there and you won't be able to do it, very frustrating. But, um, and for people that are injured, we started meeting just no way, just try to do the movement from getting up off the ground and you can work yourself up to a, you know, two, three poo kettlebell if you want, but not necessary to get the, to get the results out of it, but very efficient way. And, you know, two or three sets of each side and you're done. <laughs> That's all you have to do. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I remember doing those for when I was in, uh, Navin in the CCHL, um, it was very interesting. Yeah, we, our trainer had us do those, not on a weekly basis, but we would mix that into our training relatively consistently. So I definitely, I can see as you explain it, why it's so valuable to add that as such a, to work so many muscles in such a short time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, you're, like I said, you're rolling, you're kneeling, you're standing up and you're, and you're reaching all at the same time. And it gets all four, you get your internal, external obliques, your, your core, your erectors, everything's working. So nice exercise. Awesome. Okay. And for someone who maybe has a program or sorry, doesn't have a program and yeah. they aren't really sure a hundred percent if they're doing everything right, but let's say they, they have an idea, like, what would you say are some things that maybe they should consider to add in as kind of like maybe not fundamentals in the sense of, yeah, like do bench press deadlift and those things, but mm -hmm. just some more beneficial things that probably aren't in an average person's program if they're not working with professional. Yeah. I, I think, I think the way you structure it's pretty important. And I think um, rather than thinking of the body in isolated body parts or, or muscles, think of it more in terms of push pull um, and making sure that you've got a, a, a good steady diet of that set up in there. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at, you know, we'll come back to bench because bench is, you know, it's, it's the start and the finish for most people. But um, when you really break it down and think, you know, why do we like bench in terms of the tran transferability of that skill to, to the game? It, there isn't a whole lot, like, unless somebody's on top of you, why are you actually pressing them back off? But um, so that's where you might look at sleds more. I mean, sled gives you the pushing power, but really that power comes from downstairs through your legs, your arms, especially when you're on the ice, are only as effective as, as, as your lower extremity and your base is. So being able to move that load by generating power through the, through the hips and the glutes. So I would make sure that, um, that first hockey in specific, that you had something like that, um, that in, into play. Um, and just besides just the strengthening thing, I think, you know, we should talk a little bit about anaerobic and aerobic conditioning and, you know, that cardiovascular component of it. Um, I mean, the days of going and running five and 10 Ks and that transferability to, to hockey are sort of gone now. I think people are recognizing that, you know, your shift time is 45 seconds. So why do I need to be able to run for 20 minutes straight? I mean, Yes, you need to have a base of fitness there, but if you look at the amount of time that you are on the ice, um, those are more anaerobic type things where you're go, 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 and then you shut it down for a bit, then you're back on. So, you know, maybe running more things like Tabatas where you're doing 20 seconds on, 10 seconds recovery and, and running that for, for four minutes and getting eight rounds in, that's a pretty basic routine, but you can devastate yourself and get some pretty good gains just from training like that. You can add multiples of them as you get better at it and say, okay, maybe I'll wait for my heart rate to come down to 130 and then I'll hit another Tabata right away and just do repeats of that. And right. That can build you a very strong cardiovascular, cardiovascular base. Um, um, but for that, going. is there, is there anything you would recommend places to look, to learn about that? Because um, obviously like it's, it's helpful to understand like the principles you just said, or the mm -hmm. general ideas, but is there anywhere that would it be just kind of Google around and look on YouTube or is there anywhere you direct them? Yeah. I, I don't know that I have one particular source for that. I think, um, it, you know, it, certainly I think if you were to look up, um, you know, anaerobic training and hockey, you would get variations on things like that from a bunch of different coaches posting things. Um, I just think, uh, 
just thinking more about it in terms of practicality. And that's why I was thinking, you know, we often break things down to aerobic and, and anaerobic, but I think um, if you wanted to say, well, I, I like, I, I, again, I wanted to build a base for the season, you know, differentiating like, sorry, of course, I mean, I'm talking like you look at hockey, you look at running, there's a lot of things that can be, it doesn't matter what the sport is. They're all sort of similar type ideas. If you, if you didn't have access to ice, you wanted to go out and think, well, running's not really hockey, but you could go out and, and, and do run, you know, at, again, at, at something submaximal, like they talk about tempo runs. So 65%, if you do that for hundred meters, then you walk for 30, you know, or slow it down for 60 seconds. And then you do another one, you just keep doing that. And if you do that for 20 minutes, well, there's your, your base aerobic capacity. Then you do a couple of tabatas of the anaerobic. Um, I didn't answer your question because in terms of uh, looking at sources for that, that stuff, I mean, I just Google that stuff and stuff like that would come up. So, so it's out there. Um, and I'm just kind of looking at it from a practical standpoint on what I know of the human body and what I think would, would be beneficial. So that's where I get that kind of information. Gotcha. But there are people out there, I mean, and I don't have sources for you, but yeah. um, don't just that you're taking, talking to a physiotherapist who dabbles in training on the side, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I just believe that everybody has different ideas and different insights into this stuff. And sometimes it may be helpful that they don't, maybe they don't take, um, and I never recommend anybody take somebody's advice as kind of the, the one and only, but yeah, yeah. Hearing that and saying, okay, well now that makes me want to step in and say, okay, who can I talk to who knows a little more? How can I look at five different trainers who are all working on this stuff and come up with a, a plan themselves or can't work with somebody to come up with a plan? So, I mean, if you're at, if you're at a, a program, a high level program, you'll have somebody like that, that you can talk to. And if you're not, you're around a program that does have somebody like that. So I don't see what the problem would be to call up somebody else's, you know, a team's trainer and just say, Hey, these guys probably work on the side and do things as well, but they're, they're your best source. So, yeah. If you have, if your community has something like that, use those people. That's what, that's what they're for. And I find they're only too willing to ha ha or help anybody that's will willing to work at it. They get a lot of guys that are sent there to them because they're on the team and they're not necessarily the most motivated, but if somebody's motivated, um, trust me, they'll want to work with you because there's nothing better than getting somebody who's just, you know, dying to do this stuff and, and, and is, is a sponge to learn it. Um, you, you want to help those people so gotcha awesome well yeah i think that'd be very that'll that will be very helpful advice for anyone who doesn't have a, a great program to what to do to start figuring that stuff out yeah. awesome is there any other advice you give to someone in those areas or is that that good for now um in terms of the exercise yeah that's probably good for now um yeah i think we touched on a, a fair number of things awesome yeah. Cool. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was mistakes people make with their body. And so this, uh, this may turn into a part two, because I'm sure there's a, a million <laughs> different things to talk about, but um, let's touch on around two different core things and go into a little bit of detail of what are those things that players maybe could, re could realize that they're not it's probably a blind spot for most people that they think they're doing a good job, but it's really like a, a detriment in the future or just to their season coming up. Well, remember you're talking to the physiotherapist, so you're going to get a, a take on, on how it affects the body. But I would say the first one is probably overtraining. Um, you're, you're getting people that are, you know, people that are watching this are already really interested. They're doing above and beyond what other athletes are doing in order to get to that spot. So when you've got that kind of drive, it's very easy to say, I can tack something else on. They're not doing it. I'll do that. That'll make me that much better. But when you have your hand in too many pots at once, it's very easy to, you know, to get fried doing that. Um, if you're working with, you know, if you're playing a variety of sports or working on two different teams, sometimes each person's running you and doing their own thing and they're not really talking to the other person they don't know how much they're getting and i would see this in with the basketball team i was working on they would be they would have an aau team plus their prep school team that they're working on if they're going to high school 
they might have a gym class, their gym teacher's doing something with them too. And um, you really have to become an advocate yourself very quickly to say, listen, nobody is overseeing this whole thing. And, and we need to really make sure that you're not, um, you're not beating yourself into the ground. And so overtraining is, is, is a big thing. And there are, luckily there are many ways to check to see if that's happening these days. I mean, you can, um, you can do some simple things like check your rest and pulse rate in the morning and see if that's, if that's change, changing. Like, I mean, maybe it, on a day where you haven't worked out for a few days, you can get a stable, take your pulse as soon as you wake up and then, you know, just watch to see if it's going up by more than five beats a minute was something that I'd read once that, that that's a sign that, Hey, maybe you're not as recovered when, as you are. So your training should, you should back off on that or, you know, there's um, even things uh, like body or grip strength. I, grip strength was one thing that was really interesting. I heard one thing where a guy was doing that with uh, checking grip strength and he found that if there was a, a decrease of um, two kilograms, that it was a sign that your central nervous system wasn't recovered enough. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there are lots of ways to do that. There are lots of monitors. There's um, somebody had a ring on the other day, an aura yeah. ring. And, there's lots of those things that can, you know, can can watch to see what you're doing. The the whoop, the um, yeah. Apple Watch. Uh, I've even seen O2 sensors <laughs> that people have had in, in wrists. Um, so there's a lot of technology that that is beneficial for helping you. You know, you may not want to go and buy that, but if you've got a friend that's got it, just borrow it for a week. Learn your numbers. Just get a baseline for. What does that feel like? What does rest feel like? What does overtraining look like when it's telling you how do you actually feel? If you can learn what that feeling's like, that's very valuable. I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, I like that. I think I think that could be a a good approach for someone is to maybe even like rent someone's aura ring or something like that. Yeah. To say, hey, yeah. like, can I use this for a week? I just want to figure some things out, and then I'll give you a twenty bucks or something instead yeah. of three hundred on it. Hon honestly, because it really. Um, it'd be interesting to know how many people like you, the whole idea is to learn how your body works and, and not be relying on something else and you know it's great technology but there you can get a feel for it and you can learn what your body feels like and say uh, I thought I was recovered but apparently I'm not <laughs> and yeah. it just helps you decide is this a day that I'm going to push for PR or is this a day that I'm just going to say nope I just got to just get out there and, and, and do what feels right um yeah, if, if, if somebody can learn that in an early age, you're really well off. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. And um, what was the other kind of core thing you wanted to touch on there? Mm -hmm. I would say from, again, from our standpoint, it's, it's probably returning too soon from an injury. Um, I mean, that's as much on your team to help you decide that as it is you, but, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than just saying, oh, you broke your wrist six weeks has passed go ahead you know go, go use it again um what what other strength have you lost in the meantime what's your other arm you know got up to so yeah i mean yeah, those sorts of things i think they're i mean the, the common one now is with uh, i think acl repair you know we've really learned a lot in the last few years it used to be pretty much six to nine months you're back on the ice and now they're saying you know it could be a year it could actually be two years before some people are ready and we're not quite sure if it's just a question of just time but it's certainly not a question of just strength there are there are other aspects that we have to have to consider and we talked about that before about the psychology of being injured and you know have you retrained that is your body are you tentative going into the going into the corner you know that's a bad thing when you're when you're not confident and you're putting yourself back out there so you um you have to train that mental as much as you train the physical. And, um, you know, we use other things to decide it, but, um, you know, here we go after knowing all this and we still know that retail rates are pretty high in there. So we're, we're still missing some things with it. Um, and it can be tempting to try to say, well, I just want to be ready for the postseason." But, you know, when you've missed most of the regular season, depends on how much, yeah, I, I, I just, I'm a big, proponent of you know you've got to be able to pretty much do full-on practices for a couple of weeks before you're you should even be thinking about getting back into the game it's not just oh the cast came off yesterday by the weekend that's the next uh, tournament i want to be ready for that you're, 
you haven't been able to engage in a full, um, you know, full contact practice, and you're not, we're not even putting you back out there. Right. Got it. Awesome. Well, and the last thing I wanted to touch on was, are there any things that you have kind of recently been looking into that maybe you don't have like a ton of like details on like, okay, this is the next thing in terms of like performance in an area, but is there anything that you think is something that people should be looking at or looking into that is a kind of cool topic that maybe will influence them as they kind of continue on the journey towards just self-improvement overall? Hmm. <laughs> Keep probing me with that question because I'm not quite sure how to answer it yet. Yeah. But what, what are you getting at in terms yeah. of... Uh, it, it could be, it could be certain tools maybe that are on the rise in terms of like, it could be like a Farrah gun or something like that, or um, just, just something that maybe someone could take that would inspire someone to look into how they can um, really just explore something else in performance. Because I know I always like to learn like maybe something that you're currently doing with your own training or something that you found or discovered that maybe not everybody's pushing in the, uh, in the therapy realm. Um, does anything come to mind there? Hmm. I think that's a good question. I just can't, uh, I can't formulate something on the, on the spot here. I mean, I think about my, my training, I'm not doing anything earth shattering. Uh, as I told you, I'm doing a fair bit of, fair bit of CrossFit and that's just trying to get your, you know, working with, um, it, for me, it's more about variety and, and, and trying to trying to stay interested. And um, you can get into a rut pretty easily when you're when you're kind of training on your own. I mean, if you're playing in in season with your with your um, with your team, I think that kind of takes care of itself. But for me, I think this would be kind of similar. I'm always looking for something that gives me new inspiration to do it again. And I think you know, if we're talking about hockey players. You know, when you get a chance to do something else, learn something completely different. Like, go do something that just you know. There's so much crossover to it with so many things, but get something away from like your comfort level. That's probably probably the best way to do it. Like, um, you just you can't be pushing at the same thing all the time. You don't build. You know, we all want to be better humans and athletes in the end, and you don't get that way by doing the same movement pattern. So. So being able to change things up, um, you know, it frees your mind a little bit and it also makes you, you know, better at, better at movement, which is really what we're all striving for when we're, when we're doing athletics. So, I mean, for me, it's trying to walk on my hands, still stuck at that. Um, but I will, I will keep endeavoring to, to work on that, um, get myself my vestibular world upside down and try to move across the floor with it. Um, but in terms of in terms of technology, yeah, you're right. The whole uh, you know Theragun thing is a big thing. I mean, in our clinic, we're using, and it's not the newest thing, but you know, radio shockwave therapy is, you know, it's, is a treatment that we uh, that we do that has been a, a useful tool to help push people through um, plateaus that they've got in, in, in recovery with scar tissue and so forth. Um, so yeah, I. Um, I don't know. I, I, I almost turned that around and ask you, what do you think, Corson? <laughs> yeah, well, I really like that. Um, I mean, in uh, people who listen to my stuff, I think they, they kind of know what it is that I'm usually into. I think right now, a really big thing has been yoga. Um, yeah. I used to kind of think that yoga was just glorified stretching. And some of my friends may have even heard me say that. And yeah. I, and I'd like to actually hear your take on this before we close up is, um, so I've been, I, I treat it as I do kind of a different type of yoga session every single day. And what I found is it's just given me a lot of variety, like you mentioned, and kind of keeping me interested in moving in different ways. And I, I found it's helped with my back that was bugging me after doing those deadlift things. And um, yeah, I think that's been like the one thing that I've really like kind of completely changed i've also gotten into kind of doing like jogging on a more consistent basis and playing around with the idea of just like having solid aerobic cardio i think mm. is something that i think is just helpful in like overall feeling better 
So that's, mm -hmm. that's something I've been playing around with as well. Yeah, I guess that does make me think of some, some really quick things. And I'll do this with people that, you know, really helps people that are recovering that are in pain all the time is, it's just some breathing techniques. Some, I mean, it's a big catchphrase and there's, there's tons of different talks about relaxation, breathing, deep breathing, um, um, gratitude, breathing, but they all, what they all have in common is becoming very focused on how you take that area in uh, more just trying to block out all of the thoughts and, and not have um, all those demands and daily things going through your head and just literally focusing on that for, uh, you know, for even a minute, two minutes a day. It's, it's so easy to do. It's, it's so fast. And there is a very, um, there's a very quick benefit that you can feel when you, when you reset that. And I've seen anywhere from, you know, you got to breathe in for three seconds. You have to breathe in for five seconds. You have to hold for one or two, but it's generally a ratio of breathing out, maybe double what it took to breathe in or at least two thirds longer what you took to breathe in versus a, a pause in the middle. And, um, and, but just, it's more about being aware of that breath. And, and that seems to uh, have some pretty immediate um, scientific benefits for, for blood pressure, for feeling the wellness and decreasing anxiety, but also a lot of pain. We can get all into the talk about hypercapnia and, and CO2 and, and, and breathing and so forth. But a lot of pain is, is induced just from poor breathing habits and, and trying to reset that a um, couple of times a day can probably go a long way in, in giving somebody a sense of control back in their life and, and, and resetting things and they start to, they start to take off. And I think yoga tends to incorporate some awareness of breathing at the same time with movement, um, the feeling of being grounded and, and moving through. We, we want to talk about this a lot with, you know, pushing through the ground and trying to feel the ground through there and then coming back up. And that's, you know, they're describing what we want for power anyways, which is stacking things together. And um, they'll say it from a different angle. And sometimes the way that's explained to you, you know, you know, resounds more, um, more completely with some people. So, I, I, I like the fact that yoga is so different from what hockey does to you all the time. And I think forcing people to do things that are a little uncomfortable or they're not master that is always a good thing. Anytime you're making your brain problem solve and work through something, you are getting better. That's awesome. And the final question I had, and this is, I like to hit people at the end with this one is what, if you could have a billboard and I've stolen this from a guy named Tim Ferriss, if you could have a billboard that said like a sentence or two that, and you can describe what it means to you, but is there something you would put on that, that kind of, you would, a general piece of advice or a general thought that you think in terms of kind of hockey players, or it could be just athletes in general that maybe stands out to you. And I like doing this because I, I like that it can be a different answer every time you may think of something now and think of something completely different another time. Yeah. Um, what would my billboard say to a hockey player? Um, um, hmm. uh, I guess it would it would have to be. Yeah, it, it, rather than just say enjoy the journey because I think that's important, but I think it's I think it's learn from the journey because there is so much you learn through sport um more more about yourself more about people more about more than you'll learn and you know in just about anything else even in a formal schooling setting there is so much opportunity at when you're part of a team sport like that um and if you can be a student of that whole process as well as just trying to be the best at it um and, and i know that's something that I noticed with you that you were always interested in the why does this work? How does this how does this work? And I think for people that are going through the sport and they're using that as a as a platform to take that information in and to learn about things, I think those are the people in the end that are going to be really successful as humans and and you know career life and all of that. So I think that's what I would probably say is learn from the journey. Great. Well, 
five minutes and it might be different. But that's my answer for right now. Awesome. Well, I think that's an awesome one. And I think it's very helpful the way you broke that piece down. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I know that people yeah. are going to get a ton from this, no matter if they're a young player just learning about this stuff or there's someone who knows a ton and kind of may have gotten just a little bit of insight that may kind of put them off on a new path of, of learning. So thank you. I hope that's true. That's good. That was nice talking to you, Carson. All right. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Night. Night.